Okay, we'll just wait a couple of minutes. Yeah. Oh, he's on. Okay. Okay. Okay, we're good to go, I think. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, please do, if you're just coming on, please do mute yourself. Um, we'll be time for questions at the end when you can unmute yourself. Point number one. Point number two, this is streaming to YouTube. So everything's going out live. There's like a 30 second lag, but it's pretty much live going out right now. Um, and third and final um, questions from the committee members, just the committee members, please save those until the closed portion of the, of the defense, but everybody else, you are welcome to ask questions. That's the, that's the, uh, the boilerplate stuff. Now I can do my proper introduction, <laughs> okay. So welcome everyone for, for coming today, um, both from within the Columbia community, but also I can see uh, many from beyond, which is wonderful to see. It's always a very exciting and a very proud day for an advisor when their student completes their PhD, the highest academic degree attainable. Um, and today is in many ways extra special because the student is herself extra special. Since our first meeting, which is actually back at Harvard, um, what must have been like six, six, seven years ago, when Moya was an undergraduate and I was her postdoc advisor back then, Moya has uh, continuously amazed me with both her unique skill sets aspirations and her mindset and the challenges that she has faced as a black woman in STEM. As we will hear today, Moya's PhD journey has been unique in many ways. First off, she has intellectually pursued an unusually interdisciplinary thesis, fusing both our study of the Milky Way galaxy with that of exoplanets, pushing her to obtain expertise in disparate fields that we often honestly don't talk to each other enough between those two categories. So she's been pushing between those two boundaries. Second, she's become a very well-known New York City scientific communicator, as I'm sure many here know, taking outreach to levels far above and beyond that of her peers. Indeed, it's actually within that work that Moya has discovered her passion and will be uh, using that as a springboard for the next step in her career. And finally, Moya's background as a double major in mythology and astronomy, as well as her experience as an underrepresented minority in science, have produced a truly unique voice within astronomy and one that has resonated with many of us here today. So it's been a pleasure and a privilege to have helped Moya in her journey. And as she now prepares to forge a career in scientific communication, we can all look back to today and say, I was there on the day that Dr. McTeer defended her PhD thesis. And so with that, I'd like to introduce the soon to be Dr. Moya McTeer. Oh, thanks, David. Thank you for that introduction. You said so many nice things. Uh, and thank you all for coming here on what for you is probably a random Tuesday. But for me, it's the most important day in my career as a research scientist. So that's pretty cool to hear. Uh, I'm turning on closed captions. They're automatic from Google Slides. So they're not going to be perfect, but I hope that they help with anyone who needs them. Oh, OK. Over the next 40 or so minutes, I'm gonna be trying to answer this question. Why are we here? By which I mean, why are we here in this random part of the galaxy about halfway between the center and the edge here nestled in between the spiral arms? I call this the boring suburbs of the galaxy. Uh, so why are we there? Some astronomers would classify my work as the search for the galactic habitable zone, which is the place in the galaxy where habitable planets are most likely to form. And I'm really excited to be sharing my work with you today because this question, why are we here, is actually the question I had in mind when I applied to grad school for the first time, for the only time, when I applied to grad school back in 2015. Uh, so this is a, an exciting day and thanks again for being here. By the end of this talk, there are a few things that I hope you know. Uh, I hope you know what the galactic habitable zone is and how we define its edges. Uh, I hope you'll learn about exotopography, which is a word I made up in my first grad school project, but I'll tell you all about it. And I hope that by the end of this talk, you'll know what conditions are best for observing exotopographical signals. And I hope you'll know about the Milky Way bulge and how many stars in the bulge experience close stellar encounters. And of course, uh, what some of the consequences of those encounters might be. And you know, that's not all I hope you learn. If there's something else you pick up, whether you think it's big or small, uh, I, I would love to hear that at the end of the talk. So I'll be giving you an opportunity to maybe share some of the like extra facts that you learned here. 
Before we get started with the, the talk, there are a few people that I need to, that I want to acknowledge. I've been really lucky over the last five years to work with four amazing advisors, David Kipping, Katherine Johnson, Keith Hawkins, and Kate Daniel. Um, if you are familiar with these scientists and their work, then that gives you a little bit of insight into the types of data and tools and methods that I've used in my research. And you'll see those coming up in the talk. Uh, but for those of you who aren't familiar, David does a lot with exoplanets and exomoons and planet statistics, which is uh, something I've really enjoyed learning. And Catherine, Keith, and Kate do a lot with galactic dynamics and galactic archaeology. Uh, Keith coming in with the chemistry expertise, which was a uh, clutch, definitely, in my second year project. Uh, I was funded throughout my PhD by the National Science Foundation. I think I'm legally obligated to say that, but I'm also very proud of it. Uh, so for the past three years, I've been an NSF graduate research fellow. And this work was done on traditional unceded Lenape land. It's really important to acknowledge that. Given our country's history, uh, there are also so many people who helped me along this journey, friends, family members, people in different communities that I'm a part of, especially the New York City SciComm scene. Thank you all so much. I don't have time to thank you all individually right here, but know that it made a huge difference and I appreciate everyone who supported me along this path. Okay, so now for science. Uh, this talk is about galactic habitable zones and there's one word in that phrase that I really wanna zero in on, it's habitable. What does it mean to be habitable? Well, Traditionally, when astronomers talk about habitability, what we mean is it has liquid water. And this comes from the fact that we live on a planet that's what, like 70% water, and almost all of the life forms that we've ever discovered need water in some way to survive. So it makes sense that we would be looking for water if, if we're interested in finding human-like life. But it also is a pretty good general heuristic. Uh, water is the universal solvent, which means it's really good at dissolving molecules uh, into its component parts. And that's something that you want around if you want to create a, an opportunity for the building blocks of life, you know, the, the carbons, the nitrogens, the hydrogens, if you want those to be able to come together in a primordial ooze type of situation. So we're looking for water. And that's not it, but water's the big one. Uh, back in the 1800s, astronomers knew, they knew by then that the Earth wasn't the center of the universe. They understood that we had a sun in the middle of our solar system and that there were planets orbiting it. So they started looking at the other planets to see if they also harbored life. When they were doing that, uh, they were looking for, well, when you're interested in discovering or understanding the habitability of individual planets, there are some factors that are important to consider. Things like the planet's composition. What is that planet actually made out of? What's its atmosphere made out of? Does the planet have any sort of internal heating mechanisms like volcanism? Uh, does the planet have plate tectonics? Does it, does it have oceans? How reflective is its surface? That's what albedo means. So these are things that are important to consider uh, on what I call the planetary scale of habitability. What you're interested in if you're looking at individual planets and trying to figure out if they can host life. The next scale up from the planetary scale of habitability is the stellar system scale of habitability. So in the 1950s, astronomers were trying to figure out if there is a place, if there's a relationship that tells you where in a stellar system, uh, which is the generalized term of a solar system, uh, where in a stellar system might you be most likely to find life. And they came up with the concept of the circumstellar habitable zone. This is the distance around a star where the temperature is just right for liquid water. If you're any closer, then it's gonna to be too hot and the water will all evaporate away. If you're any further away from the star, then it's gonna to be too cold and your water will freeze. Uh, you may have heard this called the Goldilocks zone, uh, presumably named by some astronomer who was very interested in fairy tales. So that's a kindred spirit right there. Uh, but this is, is called the Goldilocks zone because you're looking for the place where the temperature is just right. Not too hot, not too cold. On this scale of habitability, the important factors to consider are stellar temperature, how hot is your star, how far is the planet away from the star, right? The, the circumstellar habitable zone is about distance. But there are some other things that we have learned 
since the 1950s are important for habitability. Things like how eccentric is the planet's orbit? Eccentricity is a measure of how, um, how round or how elliptical the planet's orbit is. Uh, does the planet have any nearby planetary neighbors that could change its orbit? Is it orbiting near any sort of debris disk like we have um, in our solar system between Mars and Jupiter? So these are the important factors to consider on the stellar system scale of habitability. The next scale up, if you're, if you're zooming out and out again, is the galactic scale of habitability. But it took until 2001 for astronomers to start thinking about this scale of habitability. And when they did, it was uh, a paper in 2001 by a team led by Guillermo Gonzalez. I've read this paper so many times uh, because it is the field defining paper for uh, the search for galactic habitable zones. So in that paper, they said that the outer edge of the galactic habitable zone, you know, so the, the furthest place that you could be in the galaxy and be in this GHZ, is set by metallicity. If you're not familiar with this term, metallicity means, uh, or astronomers call anything that's heavier than helium a metal, which might be frustrating to some people, but that's the jargon we use. Uh, so anything higher than helium is a metal. The amount of elements higher than helium that you have is metallicity. Uh, and this is really cool because all of the heavy or most of the heavy elements uh, in our universe, uh, or at least the, I'm not saying this right, but uh, elements between like helium and iron, anything uh, lithium, beryllium, all the way up to iron, they're created in the cores of stars, like you see here in this diagram. And as those stars age essentially and die, if they explode, then they'll take all of those heavy elements that they made in their cores and they'll feed the space between the stars, the space that we call the interstellar medium. And as time goes on, more stars create more heavier elements. So the metallicity increases. Uh, so that's metallicity. The inner edge of the galactic habitable zone is set by radiation. And there are a lot of different sources for this radiation, things like gamma ray bursts, active galactic nuclei, um, even just the cosmic rays. But the big one, the one that we really need to worry about is supernovae. Supernova can create these extremely powerful uh, explosions that over the course of, of a month or so can produce as much energy as our sun will in its entire 10 billion year lifespan. And if you are a planet close enough to one of these supernova explosions, you can have really bad consequences. It can destroy your atmosphere. It can uh, increase rates of genetic mutation. It can cause mass extinction events going up the food chain after it affects the way that plants photosynthesize. So we wanna be far away from any supernova explosions. Uh, other galactic habitable zone researchers since 2001 have made other points about <laughs> the boundaries of this zone. Things like um, you know, these edges, these boundaries, they change over time as uh, more and more generations of stars produced metals, then the outer edge can drift out um, because there are more stars producing these metals further out uh, from the galactic center. It's also important to note that stars can move in and out of safe zones over time. Uh, if you picture the Milky Way in your head, you would probably picture those beautiful spiral arms. Well, beautiful though they may be, they're pretty dangerous. They're, they're dense regions with lots of gas and stars, a lot of potential for supernova explosions, and stars can move through the spiral arms over time. So stars can move in and out of habitable zones. The consensus seems to be from the galactic habitable zone community that this zone is an annulus, which means it's a, it's a ring, it's like a flattened donut. Uh, it's an annulus between seven and nine kiloparsecs from the galactic center. We uh, here in our solar system are about eight kiloparsecs from the galactic center. So we are smack dab in the middle of this galactic habitable zone. Really interesting. <laughs> Uh, but why does it matter? It's interesting, but why does it matter? Well, the pursuit of knowledge just for knowledge's sake is one of the most noble human pursuits, so there's that. But why specifically does this research matter? What is the motivation for this work? Uh, there are a lot of people who study exoplanets relative to the number of astronomers who study other things. 
uh, but astronomy is still a relatively small field. But there, there are a lot of people who study exoplanets and many of them study exoplanets because they want to learn more about how planets form and evolve so that they can learn about our own solar system and our own planet and maybe make predictions for what's gonna happen to us next. But there are also a lot of exoplanetary scientists who would be lying if they said they weren't interested in, I'm gonna say the buzzword here, aliens, right? Um, a lot of people study exoplanets so that we can learn more about alien life, extraterrestrial life. And we have learned since 1995 when the first exoplanet was discovered that there are so many planets, they're not rare. They are very common in our galaxy. Uh, estimates say that there might be a couple of planets for every star in our galaxy. So there are a lot of planets out there, which is great, but it makes our search for extraterrestrial life really difficult. It's worse than searching for a needle in a haystack because in this case, we don't even know that the needle is there. We don't know that the needle exists and we're just searching through this haystack, trying to find one. The cool thing about the galactic habitable zone is that it can limit our volume, our search volume, when we're looking for extraterrestrial life. So it basically means that we can just take a, an armful of this haystack, move it over and search for the needle in that, in that stack that we um, took out of the big one. Uh, is there anything else you wanna say about that? No, I, I think that's it, yeah. So it helps us um, make our search for extraterrestrial life more efficient. Uh, I mostly uh, have contributed to this search for the galactic habitable zone by studying the dynamics of the galaxy. So most of my work has tried to figure out how the motion of the Milky Way, how the motion of stars around the Milky Way affects exoplanet habitability. And here is a little bit of a journey through my thesis. I started on the planetary scale of habitability with a project to understand what makes planets habitable from from the inside out, really. I then zoomed out in scope to try and understand how stars and their chemistry, remember the, the metals that they produce in their cores, how are those stars moving around the galaxy? I then did a project to understand how stellar motion affects planets specifically in the solar neighborhood, the place around the sun. And then I did a similar project to understand how stellar motion affects planets in the bulge of the galaxy, which is a different place and I'll explain how it's different later. To understand these things, what makes planets habitable, how are stars moving, how do they affect planet habitability, I needed to know four different pieces of information. One, where are the stars? Two, how are they moving? Three, what are they made of? And four, do they have planets? I needed to know which stars have planets, and the more I know about those planets, the better. To get those pieces of information, here is the type of data that I have worked with. Uh, I, I needed astrometric data. Astrometry is, is um, you know, positions of stars, positions and motions of stars. And so this really, really amazing survey was launched in 2013 uh, called the Gaia Telescope. It was an all sky astrometric survey. So it took this type of information for stars all over the sky and it gave us positions, um, parallaxes and proper motions and radial velocities for stars, which gives us their velocities. Um, and it gave us the most precise map of the galaxy that we have ever had to date for more than 1.4 billion stars. That's about 1% of the stars in the Milky Way, which might not seem like a lot, but this is leaps and bounds beyond what we've had before, because uh, there are a lot of stars and just knowing about a billion of them makes a big difference. That tells me where stars are and how they're moving. The there are a lot of different chemistry surveys. Uh, I particularly use GALA, uh, which looks at about 600,000 stars in the southern sky uh, and gave 30 different elemental abundances for most of those 600,000 stars. So with this chemistry data, I know what the stars are made of. Uh, and then to understand whether or not these stars have planets, I used Kepler data in a couple of my projects. The Kepler telescope was launched in 2009 and looked at 200,000 stars for almost four years constantly uh, without stop. And it was um, responsible for finding most of the planets that we've confirmed. We've now confirmed, I checked earlier this morning, we've confirmed the existence of more than 4,300 planets outside of our solar system and Kepler was responsible for a lot of those. So by far one of the most successful planet hunting missions to date.
All right, now we're in the part where I can actually talk about my research and what I've done. Uh, my first project in my first year was uh, exotopography, which is a word I made up to mean the topographical features on the surfaces of exoplanets. So mountains and volcanoes and these, these like big trenches, but on planets outside of our solar system. If you're interested in reading the paper and if you know how to use the magic of QR codes, uh, that QR code in the top right will take you to the paper that I wrote about this project. Exotopography works based on uh, transit photometry, traditional transit photometry with a twist, I like to call it. So traditionally, transit photometry, uh, when you're using this method, you have a telescope like Kepler. This is what Kepler did. It looks at a patch of sky and measures the amount of light you get from that sky over time. If a planet passes in front of one of those stars, uh, and we have to be really lucky for this to happen because you need, you need the right orientation of the system. Uh, but if we are lucky enough to see a, a planet pass in front of one of these stars, we'll measure a dip in the amount of light we get from the system because the planet is blocking some of the light. And so you can see here in the bottom, I hope you can see my cursor, we trace out what we call a transit light curve. We can study that curve to learn things about the planet, like how big it is and how far away it is from its star. But the traditional way assumes that the planet is totally spherical. And so it assumes that you have a really nice flat bottom to this curve. But as we all know from living on a planet and from watching sci-fi where they show planets with beautiful mountain scenes, real planets have bumps. Uh, they have bumps that might show up in uh, a, a transit light curve like this. So the idea behind this project was that if a planet with bumps is able to rotate as it passes in front of its star, then those bumps will change the silhouette of the planet. And that means it will change the area of the planet and change the amount of light that that planet is blocking from the star. That would create scatter, a little bit of jaggedness in the bottom of this light curve. And in this project, uh, I came up with a way to go from the amount of scatter that we see in the bottom of that light curve and back out how bumpy we think the planet is. Um, a camel actually is bumpier than, than the Earth. If you took the Earth and you shrunk it down to the size of a pool ball or a billiard ball, it would be smoother than a regulation billiard ball, which I, is, I just love that fact. Um, so this is an exaggerated Earth. We've uh, exaggerated the features by a uh, hundred times, but this light curve is unexaggerated. So we do see real scatter at the bottom of the light curve. Uh, so this is uh, the, the big plot from that paper. I looked at elevation data from the different rocky bodies in our solar system, starting over here with Mercury, Venus, the Moon, Mars, and then I had two Earths. So this Earth is the, the wet Earth. It has uh, all of the oceans on it. And then I did a cool thing where I took all of the oceans away and figured out how bumpy a dry Earth would be, and that's this brown point. Uh, so I found the relationship between bumpiness and scatter. And this relationship, this method would work best for Mars planets, Mars-sized planets around white dwarf stars. White dwarf stars have a radius about 1% the radius of the sun. They're much smaller, which means a planet the size of Mars would be able to block out a larger proportion of that star's light. And this method should be detectable with the next generation of large telescopes with diameters between like 50 and maybe even up to 100 meters, uh, although it's unclear whether or not those telescopes are actually going to be happening in the next couple of decades. Uh, exotopography is cool in its own right, but it does provide some really amazing insight into the internal processes on these planets. These big mountain ranges, they form through internal processes like plate tectonics and volcanism. If we can confirm the existence of mountains on other planets, then we can learn what's happening inside them. Uh, we might also be able to learn more about the rotation periods of planets. You know, how long is a day on one of these planets out there? And we might be able to learn about the existence of oceans or atmospheres, but all of this would require more work than what I've already done. Uh, and so I hope that scientists uh, do that one day because that'd be super bad. <laughs> all right, so moving on to a, a different project. I wanna give you some context here uh, in case you're not super familiar with how galaxies work. So here is not a real picture, not a real photograph of the Milky Way, because we've never actually left the Milky Way to then turn around and take a picture, right? Uh, but this is an artist's idea um, of what the Milky Way looks like. And there are three different 
parts of the Milky Way that uh, I want to call to your attention. So the first one is here in the middle. It's the bulge. That's what I've, I've talked about earlier in the talk. Uh, so this is the Milky Way bulge. It's a spherical group of fast moving stars. Uh, and then around the bulge, you have the disk, which I think is what most people picture when they think about the Milky Way. Uh, I often describe the disk of the Milky Way as like a pancake. It's pretty flat and, and broad. Uh, and all of the stars and gas and dust, like all of the interesting stuff is like blueberries in the pancake. You're like, that's the stuff you're interested in, right? Uh, and then surrounding this is a big dark matter halo. It's a big spherical region made mostly of dark matter. Uh, and I've heard other people say that the, the Milky Way disc and bulge is like a burger and the halo is like the burger bun. And I really like that analogy too, if that helps. Uh, so the sun is sitting about here in the Milky Way, nestled between these two arms. It rotates counterclockwise, so it goes, goes this way around the galaxy at about 230 kilometers per second, um, which is about 500,000 miles per hour. So you definitely could not race the sun in your car, but um, it's going pretty fast. For our standards, it is not going that fast on galactic standards on galactic scales. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the velocities of these stars. I'm going to be using these two um, values. So u and v are velocity vectors. u says how fast a star is moving towards the center of the galaxy, and v says how fast the star is moving um, in this perpendicular direction. It's actually tangent to the, the circular motion of the sun orbit, if that makes any sense. So in the rest of the talk, if you see me when <laughs> you, you see me saying you and V, this is what I'm talking about. All right, on to the next project. Uh, this project was about the chemistry of moving groups, understanding how stars and their chemistry move around the galaxy. A moving group is a group of stars moving in similar directions and at similar speeds. In other words, they are clustered in velocity space. It's kind of like a murmuration of birds. Uh, what, have you ever seen birds doing this? Because this is absolutely incredible and I love watching this. Uh, but these birds are moving in sync. They're moving in similar directions and at similar speeds, even though birds at like the opposite ends of this beautiful figure that they're making, they're not, they're not near each other, right? So they're distant in, in position space, but they're moving all together. Just like those birds, the moving groups, the stars in these moving groups can be distant from each other in physical space. They don't necessarily have to be right next to each other position wise, but they are separate in velocity space. <sighs> okay. Um, traditionally, this is what people do. They study moving groups and they group them in velocity space. And more recently, they were doing that for a few decades, more recently, uh, researchers have seen you know what happens if we study these groups in action space so this is showing action space actions describe the shape the entire shape of a star's orbit uh, so velocities just tell you how fast these stars are moving at a snapshot in time actions are much more helpful at giving you a more general overview of the behavior of a star and its orbit and the cool thing about studying moving groups in action space is that you get these unexpected clumps, right? These two groups are separate in velocity space, but you see that they actually overlap in action space. Now oh, that's interesting. It tells us that these stars have similar shaped orbits and that implies that they might have come from similar origins in the Milky Way. But we can't know for sure unless we look at the chemistry of these stars. So chemistry helps us untangle which groups actually do come from the same origin in the Milky Way versus which groups just happen to have similar shaped orbits. So what I did was uh, find these moving groups. I identified them in UV space. There's that UV again. Uh, I used that, do, I did that using a machine learning algorithm called extreme deconvolution Gaussian mixture models. Say that five times fast. Uh, but I found these groups in velocity space. I translated them over to action space to see how they compare. And there were some interesting findings. So if you look at these three groups specifically, then you'll see that nine and 20 and 22 all overlap. They have similar shaped orbits. Uh, and that would imply that maybe they have similar origins, remember? 
But if you look at their chemistry and the color of, of these blobs tells you the chemistry. So the outline tells you the average uh, chemical abundance for, for iron in these groups. Um, lighter means that there are more, that there's more iron and darker means that there's less iron. If you look at the chemistry here, they actually have distinct chemistry. And so um, this was the, the big learning moment for me from this research that chemistry uh, in conjunction with velocities and actions give you, gives you a much um, more complete understanding of what is happening in these moving groups. I don't have a paper for that. But I do have a paper for my third project that I worked on, which looked at stellar motion and how it affects planets specifically in the solar neighborhood. What I did, I took my Gaia data. Remember, Gaia tells me where the stars are and how they're moving. And I took Kepler data. Kepler tells me which of these planets have stars. And I made two different samples. I made a sample of stars that uh, we know have Kepler planets. And I made a sample of stars that don't have confirmed Kepler planets and I compared their velocities. And what I found was that the confirmed Kepler host stars move about 40 kilometers per second slower than the average Kepler field star. I was so excited when I found this. I think I ran down to David, my advisor's office, and uh, I, I showed him this. And he, being the good advisor that he is, told me that we should probably check some different ideas for what, what else might be causing this difference in velocity. So I did. <laughs> I checked a couple different hypotheses that I had, and the one that panned out was that this, this is apparently just a Kepler selection or observation bias. It's not Kepler's fault. It's just how it was designed. It was optimized to look at a, a certain type of star at a certain distance. Uh, so we found that this was a, a Kepler selection bias by uh, doing a, a couple more statistics things. So we found a sample of stars that were similar to the host stars, very similar, almost identical in their temperature, in their distance, in their surface gravity, and in their Kepler magnitude, which is uh, how bright they are. So these stars, um, they don't have confirmed Kepler planets. They might have planets of their own that we didn't see with Kepler, uh, but they are nearly identical to the sample of host stars. When we compared this twin sample uh, to the host star sample when we compared their velocities, they were indistinguishable. We couldn't tell the twins apart from the host stars. And that's how we knew that it was um, a Kepler selection effect. But what this told us was that there's no relationship between stellar velocity and planet occurrence in the solar neighborhood. Uh, fast stars in this part of the galaxy are just as likely to host planets as slow stars. But maybe, we figured, Maybe that's just because stars in the solar neighborhood aren't moving that fast to begin with, right? The sun is moving at about 500,000 miles per hour, but uh, that's not that fast on galactic scales. So we turned our attention to a part of the galaxy where stars are moving faster and they're closer together and their orbits are, in my opinion, I'm sorry to anyone who loves disk dynamics, in my opinion, they're more interesting. Uh, so the Milky Way bulge is denser. It has about between 10 and 30% of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy, but they're smushed into a much smaller space. The stars are moving faster too. Uh, so the average speed of stars in the solar neighborhood is about 230 kilometers per second. But in the bulge, stars are getting up to like 600 kilometers per second, which is whipping by, right? Uh, and the other interesting thing about the bulge is that the orbits there mostly aren't circular. Uh, so the sun is moving on a relatively circular orbit. There is some perturbation from a circular orbit. Imagine a spring. If you have just like a really long spring and you create a closed loop with that spring, uh, that's what the sun is doing and other stars like it in the disk. But in the bulge, they're moving on these elliptical rosette shaped orbits. If you have ever played with something called a spirograph, um, the shape that it makes is very similar to the shape that some of the bulge stars make. Uh, so that this is the Milky Way bulge. I was interested in how common stellar encounters are in the Milky Way bulge. And I'm not talking about stellar collisions. Space is really big and it's sparse enough, even in the Milky Way bulge, that stars almost never actually collide with each other. But they can have close flybys. And that's what I was interested in. Um, 
Oh crap, I meant to ask you to, to think. Um, so I simulated the orbits of a million stars in the Milky Way bulge. And I counted with a, an equation, I calculated how often those stars should have close stellar encounters. And here's what I found. Uh, I'm gonna take a second to work through this plot. Uh, so here on the x-axis is the, the number of encounters that a star can expect. And the y-axis is the fraction of stars that have encounters, that have that number of encounters. So here, let's, let's just move up this line, right? About 0% of stars have 100,000 close encounters. That makes sense, right? 100,000 encounters, that's a lot. No stars doing that. But if you move up this line, you get to about 50% and you see that 50%, half of the stars have dozens of encounters within a thousand AU. Um, and one AU is the distance between the earth and the sun. It stands for astronomical unit. If we keep moving up this line, we see that even more stars, 80% of them, eight zero, have at least one encounter per billion years. And that is way more than I expected. Um, and the cool thing about this project is that it scales with the encounter distance. So if you're interested in figuring out how common uh, encounters within 100 AU are, you can just divide, just divide by 100. Uh, so you, you move up this graph and you still see that uh, a lot of stars, something like 35%, are having encounters within uh, 100 AU. Encounters within 10 AU are rare, but we found that about one in 5,000 stars in the bulge should have an encounter within 10 AU. Uh, and that might not sound like a lot, that's a small fraction, but there are about 10 billion stars in the Milky Way bulge. So like 10 billion over 5,000, that's a lot of stars having these encounters. So encounters are common and they can have dramatic consequences for planets. So here's a video that shows you a stellar flyby. This in the middle is a sun or a star. And this, is, this disk has particles that may one day become planets. But as the other star, as the other system passes by, the gravitational interactions between the two systems causes some of the original particles to, to leave their system, right? Some of these blue particles have left the star that they were originally around. And the star has picked up some of the pink particles. So we know based on simulations like this and work that other people have done, that these close stellar encounters can do things like rip planets away from their host star. Imagine, we were just chilling here on Earth, and all of a sudden a star comes by and just rips us out of our solar system. It would suck. It would never happen here in our part of the galaxy, but it would be bad if it did. So um, these encounters can rip planets away from their host stars. They can destabilize orbits. So maybe nothing happens immediately after the encounter, but like a million years later, the planet's orbit is unstable and it either you know falls into its sun or maybe it gets flung out of its system both bad consequences. And if these encounters happen early enough, then they can actually interrupt the planet formation process altogether um, and change the architecture of the resulting system. So uh, basically what this research showed was that uh, the people who studied galactic habitable zones 20 years ago were probably right. The bulge is not a good place for life the way we know it, or at least it's not a place where we should prioritize our search for life. It's not um, an optimal place for life. Uh, also, the place where we are now <laughs> is probably good. So uh, this is the annulus that I said before between seven and nine kiloparsecs from the galactic center. And our sun is right there. It seems like this is, this is just the, the right spot for life. But why? Uh, the whole point of this presentation was to tell you why. So here is why. In this part of the galaxy, we have the right amount of metals. We have the right amount of elements that are heavier than helium to make you know, these dense, rocky planets that, are, that have iron and nickel in their cores, uh, but also enough metals to produce complex life like us uh, that is made of a lot of metals. And this is actually really helpful when I'm feeling down about myself. I look at my body and I'm like, you're made of metals. It feels good. Um, we're also lucky because we're in a sparse stellar environment. There are a lot of other stars around us. And this is good because it means we aren't near a lot of um, dangerous radiation sources like supernovae. Um, and we aren't in danger of a lot of close stellar flybys. Some people have tried to figure out whether or not there are going to be flybys to the sun anytime soon or whether or not they have happened in the past. Uh, and it seems like in the next several million years, we can expect a flyby of about um, 
20,000 AU, which is much, much larger than 1,000 AU. So we're fine here. We are lucky to be at the right distance from the galactic center that we're moving with the spiral arms. This means we don't have to pass in and out of the spiral arms many times, although it has happened in the past, according to some studies that I read in preparation for this. Uh, and we live around a long lived lonely star. Our sun is going to live for about 10 billion years on the main sequence. That's long enough for life to form and do uh, interesting stuff. Like even ask this question of why are we here in the first place? And the star is lonely. It doesn't have a binary companion. It's not part of a, of a multi-star system, which is rare-ish. Um, and yeah, it, a lot of stars have these binary companions and we do not. But does that make our part of the galaxy the galactic habitable zone? Well, remember that the habitability criteria that we're using are based on earthly life. It's based on life that we know and see under these conditions. So of course the, con the, the criteria that we use are biased in that way. Uh, so I want to be sure to leave you with the fact that the galactic habitable zone isn't prescriptive. It's not like we're saying this zone is the only place where life can happen uh, in the Milky Way. Instead, it's just a helpful tool for us to try and narrow our search so that we can uh, hopefully make our, our search for extraterrestrial life more efficient. Uh, we know based on the planets that we've seen and based on what's possible in the different scales of habitability that there is an amazing diversity of planets out there they can differ in terms of how big they are what they're made out of what type of star they orbit where in the galaxy they are it's so incredible how different planets out there can be and if dr ian malcolm is to be believed and life finds a way then that means that the life that again may be out there can also be amazingly diverse. I've spent a lot of time over the last five years doing science communication and outreach work. And one of my um, favorite, one of the one of the SciComm projects that I'm most most passionate about is my podcast Exolore, uh, which explores those amazingly diverse planets and the amazingly diverse life that we might expect to find uh, on those planets. Again. Please don't leave this talk thinking that I believe that there are definitely aliens out there. Uh, just if there are, because of the way that planets can differ, then those alien life might be very cool. Uh, and that QR code in the top will take you to a page where you can listen to Exolor if you're interested. All right, so it's the end of the talk. I told you at the beginning, roughly 40 minutes ago, that uh, 40 minutes from then, here are some things that I hope you will have learned. So. The edges of the galactic habitable zone depend on two factors, metallicity and radiation. The outer edge is based on metallicity and the inner edge is based on the amount of radiation that you can get. Uh, the second thing I wanted you to learn was exotopography. What is it? Uh, and what are the conditions that it works best for? So exotopography works best for Mars analogs orbiting white dwarfs. Uh, these are small stars so that the planet can block out a larger proportion of the star's light and make it easier for us to see the exotopography signal. And then third, how many stars in the Milky Way bulge experience close stellar encounters? About 80% within 1,000 AU. And then those encounters get less common as the encounter gets closer. Yep. Uh, so thank you so much for listening again on this random Tuesday. Most important Tuesday. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And uh, that's all I have. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Just feel free to unmute yourself. Very well done, Moya. So uh, just a reminder, uh, the committee members, please hold, your, hold back your questions. Um, but we are able and encouraging questions from anybody who would like to ask something. So please do raise your hand on the participant, participants list or you can put your question in the chat and I can read it out if you prefer. Okay, um, we have a question. Tiara, do you unmute yourself? Am I saying yeah. that right? Thank you. Great talk, Moya. Um, so my question is more so about um, 
grad school overall. And I'm wondering what was the hardest part of your project or grad school and what was it that you learned from it and what you plan to take forward? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Uh, what was hardest about the research is different than what was hardest about grad school overall, because you know grad school's tough, but the research part specifically, I dealt with a lot of really big data sets in my research. Uh, Gaia has information for over 1.4 billion stars, and that's, that's a lot of bits, a lot of bytes. I don't know which one, um, but I had to learn how to do analysis of those large data sets. And I think one of the most important things I learned from that was that if you are faced with a, a big issue, it's always possible to break it down into more digestible chunks. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. Um, Daniel, I think you had your hand raised next. I think I'm following the order here. So Daniel, you have me. Uh, yeah, I hope you can hear me with the mask and everything. Yeah. Um, awesome talk. Uh, I have a question about um, the exotopography around white dwarf. So um, you said that it's like best for Mars analogs on white dwarfs or the formation pathways of planets around white dwarfs thought to be similar to those around, you know, more main sequence stars. And if not, mm -hmm. like, is there hope to go after exotopography on like planets on main sequence stars as well? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, as far as I understand, the planets that are around white dwarfs would have been ones that formed around main sequence stars and then survived as the, the star became a white dwarf. Um, so I know that we have found one transiting planet around a white dwarf, uh, which isn't many, but we it would just be so much harder to find these signals for, for an M-dwarf star, um, we would have to spend a lot of time on very large telescopes to do that. So white dwarfs are our best bet. Awesome, thanks. Uh, Chris Carr is next, I think. Hi, Moya. Oh, fantastic talk, I loved it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I had a question about the uh, galactic habitable zone. Uh, I was, since you, you said the edges are determined by both the radiation and by the metallicity, I was wondering if the edges uh, can change with time. So whether or not, uh, so if a younger, if when the galaxy was younger, whether or not it was narrower or, or larger or, or how it can actually change in the future. Yes, great question. It absolutely changes over time. It gets broader over time as stars uh, seed the interstellar medium with more heavy metals out or further out in the edge of the, further out to the edge of the disk. Uh, and as time goes on, there will be fewer stars that can go supernova because the stellar population will become dominated by low mass stars. So the, the zone does widen over time. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Dwayne, old friend from Columbia, you're here. Do you wanna ask your question? Hi, Dwayne. <clears throat> Hello. Um... Uh, thank you, Moya. That was a fantastic uh, talk. And uh, I, too, also have a question regarding the, galab the galactic habitable zone. Um, so you had mentioned in your talk um, two of the vectors in terms of the uh, describing the velocity of the sun around uh, the galaxy. But of course, you know, we have three dimensions. Right. And so I was wondering, um, have you given any uh, consideration um, in terms of your research to the fact that the you know the, the sun bobs up and down um, around mm -hmm. the galaxy, uh, and in particular to uh, theories around orbital forcing in terms of the climate of of the Earth over time, and you know um, uh, basically some theories around mass extinctions and things of that sort. Yeah, um, we mostly ignored the third vector. So the the third velocity vector is W, which points towards the galactic north pole. Uh, we mostly ignored that vector because there wasn't much motion. Uh, there's not much U or there's not much W motion in the solar neighborhood. Uh, and in the bulge, everything is three dimensional anyway. So uh, we were considering vertical motion in the bulge. Um, for, for how it relates to you know, climate events here on earth, I didn't do anything with that specifically. I did read uh, a paper that looked at how the, the times that the sun has crossed the spiral arms, how that relates to big 
extinction events here on Earth, and there does seem to be some lineup there, uh, but they that was passing through the spiral arms and not necessarily passing through the plane of the galaxy with the with vertical motion for the solar system. Did that answer your question? It does, yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, we have uh, some more questions. So Aaron, I think you had your hand raised for a while. Hey, Maya, lovely talk. Um, I love the diversity of techniques that you've used. Um, I guess not somewhat related to Dwayne's question. I was wondering for, are there dynamical signatures, like galactic dynamical signatures that um, we should be prioritizing in this search for life locally? Like, can are there ways you can fish out like moving groups that have passed through a spiral arm recently or haven't, mm. or might have interacted in some more convoluted collisional region of the galaxy or gone through a sparser region or something like that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind when you ask that is, we can look at the chemistry of the groups to see how they uh, how they line up with the metallicity requirement for galactic habitability. Uh, basically, you want to have about as much metallicity as the sun to be considered in the galactic habitable zone. And a lot of the moving groups that we uh, identified, if you remember that that plot with their their average chemistry, a lot of them are much lower metallicity than the sun. So we could use that. Um, other dynamical, I have to think about that and get back to you, but that's a really good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm being told we only have time for one more question. I apologize. I know there's some, um, some questions on, on YouTube as well. Maybe, um, Moya might be able to answer on social media or something afterwards. But, uh, the last question we have time for is from Rose, who's been very patiently waiting here. Hi, Moya. Um, it was a really great talk and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you for that. Um, I think my question has been answered a little bit, but um, when you talk about the galactic habitable zone, it seems to be restricted to two dimensions. Um, so what happens if you go outside of the disk and do you have an idea of what sort of limitations there are in that direction? Oh, I love this question. We uh, expect that the metallicity would probably go down as you move further from the plane of the disk, just because there are fewer stars and so they wouldn't have seeded that space with the, the metals. Uh, I, the one paper I read that disagreed with the galactic habitable zone being between seven and nine kiloparsecs uh, did look at more of a three-dimensional uh, approach did take more of a three-dimensional approach to this and they found that basically the entire galaxy is going to be habitable but if you focus on the radiation that you get from supernova explosions and if you figure out how um, how many planets should be sterilized by these supernova explosions then it actually uh, they said that the galactic habitable zone is actually going to be closer to the inner galaxy uh, but within four kiloparsecs and slightly off the, the plane. So, um, you know, up to a hundred parsecs off the galactic plane would be best for life. Um. Great, well, I think we should stop there just so we have, uh, give Moya a chance to catch her breath um, before we start the closed portion of the defense. Um, so with that, let's just unmute ourselves and give Moya one last round of applause for her wonderful talk. Thank you, everyone. And committee members, we will see you at 2.30 on the other Zoom link. <laughs>